Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the awesome intro. Hi, everybody. How are we feeling? Are we all, did we all get our caffeine and water hydrated, made friends? By the way, I love that Pac-Man rule. It's so thoughtful and so inclusive. Thank you for that. All right. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, it's super exciting uh, for me to be here in one of my favorite cities in Europe. It's also sunny out there. I love the sun. I grew up by the Mediterranean. Um, so I want to start today with a quick story about how a product uh, changed the way I thought about my role as a product maker. So when I was an industrial designer, fun fact, earlier in my career, this example by Donald Norman, um, as uh, most of you might know, who was a great researcher, professor, and author working on design and cognitive science, led me to think very uniquely um, about the everyday products that we design. So in this example, he talks about salt and pepper shaker, this product that we use pretty much every day. We use it every day, but we still ask ourselves which one is the salt, which one is the pepper, how many holes represent pepper, how many holes represent salt, and many of us still pour it in our hands before we pour it in the meal, right? So design shouldn't be this complicated, right? It shouldn't force us to memorize things, cause this much stress on us. So I've always used this as a reminder for myself that everything that we design have consequences on people's lives, functional, social, emotional, ethical implications and uh, consequences. And we need to be conscious about how much power we actually hold in our hands, even when we are designing such simple products like this. And a bit about myself, since my industrial design days, I worked as a maker in various fields, from academia to game design to Internet of Things and physical computing. Then I dove right into the startup and tech world. And I wanted to introduce these companies beforehand so that you don't, um, you don't get confused about like, okay, why the hell she's talking about all these products? But I wanted to share um, these like examples and certain like practices. But I started my tech uh, career in, in Foursquare, which is a local search app discovery for new places and Swarm, which is a social app for checking in and meeting up, keeping up with friends. Anybody familiar with those apps? Any fans? All right. I hope you're going to enjoy some of the examples. And then I moved to Wunderlist uh, right around the acquisition by uh, Microsoft, building productivity tools and ecosystems based around, um, around tasks, and then working with computing powers like Cortana, Microsoft's AI. Then I joined Envision as a design director there. Um, familiar with Envision, I hope. Any feedback, any future requests, come to me. Uh, a digital product design platform uh, for teams to collaborate and create better digital experiences for their customers. And actually, fun fact, recently, uh, a few weeks ago, I left the company to pursue my own uh, path with consultancy and coaching. So wish me luck, fingers crossed, I'll be able to help the startup communities here in Europe and US. So why are we here today? Uh, to talk about design and user experience because we love both of those things. But we, before we start, let's agree on one thing. Building software is easy, but building great software that people love and relate to is fundamentally hard. And Jim Collins in his book, in his great book, uh, I highly recommend, uh, Good to Great, articulates this really well. So good is the enemy of great. And that is one of the key reasons why we have so little that becomes great. We don't have great schools, principally because we have just good schools. We don't have great government, principally because we have just good government. Few people attain great lives in large part because it's just so easy to settle for an average good life. And similarly, most, most companies never manage to become great precisely because of the same reason most of them settle down for the average just okay experiences. So today I will be talking about how to get from good to great and build products and services that people love. And together, hopefully having fun, we'll be exploring the fundamentals of a mature, strong design culture and process. We will discuss together again how to craft the right design process that incorporates user quality, user values, as well as business impact and velocity into our practice. And most importantly, discuss how to drive a culture that leads companies to innovation and long-term value. And these all sound great, but how are we going to achieve all these things? 
right? So we need to talk about three major factors that contribute to the success. Building our, a strong foundation as an organization, working well together as teams, and understanding uh, our users uh, really well as a company. And this is only possible through designing your organization, designing your teams, and designing for your users. And while I'll be touching on these areas, uh, I will also be sharing a few examples and like practical guidelines that have helped me in my own um, journey and have elevated the companies that I worked at. So, all right, let's start with the fundamentals and building our very own foundation as a company first. So screw-ups, fuck-ups, we all know, are essential um, of making something uh, great. We all make mistakes, we feel uncomfortable, and instead of punishing ourselves, uh, we acknowledge them and try to learn from them. And understanding this prevents us from stress, um, misery, and destroying our company culture at the end. And similarly, as Star Trek Discovery articulates, all life is born from chaos and destruction. Any Star Trek fans out there? I'm sorry that I pulled the quote from the crappy series Discovery, the new one, but bear with me. Um, and while we navigate through this chaos and discomfort, we need to understand that the products tend to reflect the structure and the character of the organizations that built them. A well-designed system and organization result in well-designed products and services. Before we, start for our, before we start designing for our customers, we should design our organization with a structure, values, and culture. And how can we design great companies? What powers these great companies? So one, an effective organizational structure that makes sure that work always flows smoothly from one phase to another, enables rapid responses to opportunities and threads, and empowers, most importantly, empowers employees to make decisions. Two, being proactive rather than just reactive, making intentional decisions rather than just constantly responding to incoming issues and tasks and fixing the organization or digging it out of a hole. And three, implementing company metrics around employees. This is something that we neglect most of the time. How do we acquire our diverse talent? Not just acquire, how do we retain them also in the company? How do we invest in diversity? How do we create inclusive decision-making processes? How we care about the employee experience growth and have leaders that act like coaches, mentors, rather than enforcers and dictators. And four, acknowledging our biases, those like secret, deeply, in, deeply rooted biases, and proactively striving to avoid them. And finally, uh, designing and innovating intentionally and creating long-term value while thinking about our customers. So to design a great company, it boils down to designing a culture around these three core values purpose, innovation, and empowerment based on a shared vision. And I know these words like culture, values can be quite heavy and loaded terms and often misused. Often, a lot of, a lot of times we, we are using it in every sentence, in every, uh, in every review, in every discussion that we have, but it's actually very rare to find. But by putting people first uh, through investing in design and user experience, as long as we are nurturing collaboration and inspiring each other through inclusion, we can convey this clear purpose and execute meaningful change at the end. And I would like to emphasize the part with the purpose a bit more here. So the purpose of changing people's lives as designers, engineers, innovators, storytellers in this room. And whatever it is that we are all doing, we need to put the human back in the software and start thinking in terms of just products and services and instead start thinking in terms of designing activities, understanding core user needs to enable our companies to execute with purpose rather than just uh, building a product. And this purpose can be defined only through design by putting empathy and user research front and center, setting clear company priorities and understanding the business value of design. And Ritha McGrath, who is an innovation strategy scholar, Explain this really well, why we need design, why we need to put design front and center. For too long, um, the businesses, the business world has been obsessed with building a sustainable, competitive advantage through singular product experiences using very linear and reductionist methods. 
But these products cannot exist in isolation anymore, right? So we have forces at play now. We have globalization, we have this, this digital revolution, we have competition in the market that keeps us on our toes. So now problem solving desperately needs systematic thinking and design. So we need to look at the world through the systematic lens and see everything that is being interconnected in, an, uh, in a dynamic ecosystem way. And in order to achieve this true lasting advantage, we need to shift from singular product experiences to more holistic and experienced design that evolves in an ecosystem. And doing so and creating a design-centric strategy can elevate companies in many different ways. It improves the quality of experiences. It creates new opportunities to innovate because it pushes creative thinking towards um, forward, forward in the companies and increases growth and revenue uh, through establishing trust with our customers, keeping them happy, engaged in our business, while eventually also increasing our company valuation. Yay! And design is not just also designing services and products, it's also about designing the right rituals and practices internally in our organizations, at the end which leads to maximizing our own efficiency and productivity. And at the end, it also unites our company through a consistent, cohesive brand and company culture and helps us all bring uh, together under a common goal. And bonus points, when you establish that design-oriented company culture, you also hit the jackpot for the foundation of a very good business. And as Thomas J. Watson at IBM famously states, good business, good design is also good business. The only way to grow financial capital is through investing in the human capital. And based on this philosophy in the last couple of years, we saw IBM going through a remarkable, remarkable design transformation as a company and a cultural change and starting to shape their new IBM design practice to transform their company's products and services across every line of business. And now their practice leads to first uncovering the user value by encouraging teams to follow the user, the customer pain points, measure their success, experiment, and exercise constant curiosity. And second, making it their own, right? By mixing elements together, by experimenting, designing for delightful moments, and helping people accomplish their goals through their productivity tools. And third, practicing with speed at scale. So by introducing design thinking, design operations, design systems to solve their complex business problems. And this is really fascinating to see this kind of transformation in a fairly traditional company that used to move really slow with long and cumbersome processes. And good businesses, in order to survive and succeed in today's complex world, we need, they need to generate products and services that improve the lives of their customers, and they need to innovate constantly through this rigorous, empathetic, and iterative design process. And because Innovation goes beyond uh, just the product. It's also a process, right? It's a culture that facilitates conversations and iterates, including multiple perspectives. And that's exactly why we have very, very sad, sad stories out there where big companies acquiring a lot of successful smart, smart, uh, small startups and then thinking, oh yes, now we hold the key to innovation and then failing miserably later because they are just not able to change their culture to maintain and nurture this new innovative thinking that they acquire. And innovation is hard as hell, right? Even as humans, we are designed in a way that innovation and thinking outside the box is difficult because guess what? We have biases that hold our backs, especially the most sneaky, deeply rooted ones like bias against creativity. So it's important for companies to recognize and appreciate this creativity because we might be working with all the agile methods, we might be producing, releasing updates after another, but if our company is afraid of our own creativity, then we are set for failure. And this fear also happens on a very unconscious level that sometimes we just don't even realize that. And at the end, uh, that destroys our ability to um, recognize creativity. And it's surprising and doesn't make sense, right? Like you see all these companies that, they, that scream from the top of their lungs that they want creativity, but actually deep inside they reject it. And you think the challenge um, ends here? Well, um, well, our also uh, evolution and uh, brain work against us too. 
So another fun fact is also our brains. We talked a lot about hardwired today already. Our brains are wired to be lazy. In decision making, we almost instantaneously form an opinion based on existing memories, patterns, and solutions. So we are opt, we are already wired to opt um, for the easy way out. So why deal with complex thinking and exhaust the brain, right? And you know, at the end, we need to uh, create our awareness around our uh, anti-creativity biases and learn ways to avoid them. And this brings the question of how curious we are uh, in order to sparkle these questions to uncover our biases and trigger creativity in us. And how can we, how can we pr promote curiosity uh, as a behavior, as an attitude? How can we continue asking questions and discovering and not settle for the default? So embra embracing curiosity is also a very tricky, deeply, deeply rooted, rooted pattern in us. It actually manifests itself in so many different ways. So any Internet Explorer or Safari users in the room? Any? All right. So this might, this might make you a bit upset. Um, but according to Adam Grant, who is the author of Originals, according to him, we can predict your creativity, your job performance, and your commitment just by knowing what web browser you're using. There is also good evidence that Firefox and Chrome users significantly outperform Internet Explorer and Safari users. Yes. And they also stay in their jobs 15% longer. It's crazy, right? So all these browsers are actually quite similar with the basic tasks that you can achieve, but Explorer and Safari come installed, handed over to you, Whereas with Chrome and Firefox, you doubt, looks for something different out there, and curiosity becomes a part of who you are. So yes, it's a part of a person, it's a part of who we are, whether we realize it or not, but it can still be unlocked um, with certain design-oriented practices and rituals. So I want to talk about a few of those fun stuff. So design an inclusive design process with creating, developing, and communicating ideas together is a way to fuel curiosity and creativity in companies. Because when all teams are engaged in shaping the vision of a company, invested in the problem from the very beginning, and feel like their voices do matter, then they have the opportunity to grow and move with the company and contribute to the overall creativity. When InVision looked at the maturity um, of the companies in various industries and how they adopt design in their process, we saw that the companies that kick off these kind of creative sprints and think di divergently with the, without the biases and socialize the initiatives across disciplines, distribute the authority ac across design, engineering, and product are able to transform themselves for the better. So I cannot really emphasize how helpful um, these design-oriented practices and rituals have been for product teams and company cultures. So through these practices, we are able to amplify the power of interdisciplinary collaboration, increase empathy for one another, for design, for creative thinking, push our limits and innovate and get buy-in from everybody because everybody's already involved from the very, very beginning. And most importantly, nurture a safe and fun environment because we want to also have fun at the end of the day in our work, right? So let's get to the second pillar. How are we doing so far? Thumbs up, up, all right, cool. So um, as companies, while we are navigating through all these complexities of shipping, performance metrics, all these like indicators, the scary terms, we forget one of the most crucial parts of success, teamwork. So how can we thoughtfully design teams that work well together? Actually, because the teamwork is also really, really essential to delivering great experiences, services, and we need to design teams that embody we rather than I and feel accountable and committed uh, for the work that we are doing. So let's talk in numbers with data for why it's essential. Why data? Because we all love data and numbers. So sadly, this is the reality. Only 13% of people at work engaged. 
There are various reasons for that, and I want to touch on a few of those, but first off, caution, there is no perfect formula or a perfect team out there to really speak around all of these uh, certain, certain nuances of dysfunctionality. But I still want to share a few guidelines and principles that, helped, that have helped me throughout my own career. But before we start, let's destroy a few myths that we just cannot freaking stop talking about. First off, we think we need to hire superpowers that are amazing in a very niche skill set, super vertical experts in a domain, we throw rock star, guru, wizard, ninja, all, the, all those fancy words into the mix, forgetting the fact that superpowers can sometimes be loners and might not fit into a team. So sure, we definitely need those superpowers, those interesting differentiator competence skill sets um, in our teams, but we should still look for holistic skills like creative thinking, problem solving, and communication, or people that are just plain humble and generous and smart that will raise the quality bar in our team. Because creating a smart team that works in harmony, that work, work together, that work well together is a lot easier than relying on one single rock star talent with superpowers. And again, numbers tell us the consequences of a bad hire. 25% loss in productivity, 31% of affected employee morale in a negative way, and 17,000 euros. Um, average cost of one bad, empire, uh, bad hire per year. Second one, we need to assess for culture fit. Do we? I mean, yes, we definitely need to look for people that believe in our core values, but sometimes we drop the culture and just look for fit. Look for people with similar thoughts, approaches, styles, and thereby end up maintaining an environment that is far from diverse or inclusive. We get caught up in groupthink, neglect to celebrate different behavioral strengths and viewpoints. So here I would like to suggest something new and say we need to look for culture ad and hire people with unique viewpoints, values, and personality traits. Because again, let the numbers speak. Diverse teams outperform non-diverse non teams by 35%. And at the end, these diverse, diverse teams also create more revenue, 19% more revenue. So we see that there is a strong and st statistically significant correlation between the diversity of the teams and the innovation that they create. Another myth, conflict is bad. We should also press it and never question why we disagree with one another. Actually, conflict can be very healthy, push us further to get better at what we do, and once it's recognized as a positive space, we can challenge each other and learn from each other. Maybe we fight with, an, with one another, but we all achieve, we all try to achieve a common goal with passion and purpose. So, yes, conflict can be a major source of distress, but also challenging one another can lastly alter our brains for the better. So scientists have found that challenging the brain with new activities, new perspectives, also helps to build new brain cells and strengthen the connections between them and make people feel more engaged and fuel innovation. We need to scale, we need to scale fast. So scale means success, right? Investors love scale and growth. We better maximize the business and grow as fast as possible if we want that next round of investment. But before we scale, companies need to assess their infrastructure, operational framework, really in depth so that the scale doesn't come at a cost of killing culture, killing productivity through cumbersome process, and causing us to lose what we made the company, what made the company unique in the first place. So Uber has experienced this crazy 10x rapid growth uh, in a crazy short amount of time. So from 200 engineers in 2014 to 2000 in 2016, they ended up with various operational dysfunctions. So they had to juggle productivity risks and high technical costs of navigating through code and running big deployments with 1,000 microservices and 8,000 repositories. 8,000 repositories. So wanting to accelerate our growth and scale up and be more competitive in the market is absolutely okay. But we need to scale up in a manageable and healthy manner on a strong foundation based on careful and effective planning of tasks, roles, and processes. This is one of my favorites. 
So as social beings, we are driven to preserve our relationships, right? So we don't want to let anybody down uh, by saying no. And we try to be those like hustlers and like, yes, can do, and we can just get shit done. Yes, but no actually can be very powerful and not just for our own sanity, but also for our products. Not saying no and letting features creep is the enemy of good experience. And a product without an identity is nothing but just average. And people like our products when we say no. People like our products when our products are opinionated and don't do 100 different things all at once. They like them because they are designed by people that know when to challenge one another and listen to their customers. Patrick Lincioni in his book, uh, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, summarizes these myths so well and points us in the right direction for how we can create teams that are happy and productive. He talks about the fact that every dysfunctional team breaks down at a very specific point when they lack trust. And a team that lacks trust has a fear of conflict. A team that has a fear of conflict has a fear of commitment. Bear with me. A team that has a fear of commitment has a fear of accountability. So his conclusion is, if you have a team that doesn't hold themselves accountable, it leads to inattention to results and lack of collaboration and hence poor products. So instead of these myths, let's design our teams based on commitment, diversity and collaboration. So at Envision, we work within a squad framework uh, with design, engineering, and product as equal partners, just like in a three-legged stool. And our framework is built upon autonomy, ownership, transparency, and flexibility that lead us to commitment. So I want to dig a little deeper into each of these. So ownership is good because our teams know that they are the experts and feel accountability. Autonomy drives us to make decisions, make decisions fast and autonomously that might lead to sometimes breaking the rules, but for the better, better because again, uh, it helps us build deeper trust and respect within our teams. And it, it again, like provides us with the sense of collective ownership. Transparency, it helps us get better at communication, embrace our learnings and share widely with others. And flexibility, leading to adaptability and embracing change. It helps us move to different roles, different missions when necessary or desired. And at the end, creating uh, different car career paths, uh, fueling diversity and inclusion and innovation. And most importantly, it's based on learning and building partnerships where not just designers, but every team has an in-depth knowledge of UX and empathy for customers, creating value, managing risk and performance together, both for the company and uh, the product. So with putting design-oriented thinking in the core of a team and being more purpose-driven than revenue-driven, with this model, the whole team becomes empathetic more purpose-driven and iterative by learning from one another and creating a shared vision to change customer lives for the better. And when I look at this, it kind of reminds me of developers and PMs saying like, oh no, I don't do design stuff. Oh no, I cannot draw pretty. I cannot, I'm not sure if I can contribute to this design session. And three sprints later, then you all see that people Everybody, every discipline in the team feel empowered to part participate in the process and understand care for customers and understand that design is not just for designers. They start to even apply some of the design thinking methods to the problems that are not even design related anymore. Because design is not just like cool kids doing cool things with cool, cool tools out there in a corner, it's a way of thinking, it's a multidisciplinary approach to solving problems creatively. And we don't want an organization where designers are the sole gatekeepers to dictate what is right, what is right to do um, for the customers. And bonus points here too, through these like sprints, creative thinking and design oriented practices, we destroy internal biases against one another. Like designers are high maintenance, right? Or they prefer form to function or developers, they just don't care about, don't, don't care about um, users or other designers. And how many of you are familiar with this ongoing discussion, MVP versus MLP? So as you know, MVP, minimum viable product, is typically created to bring back the maximum amount of learning um, with the least effort. 
But the truth is a product isn't really viable until it's loved. So with this MLP, minimum lovable product approach, we still want that validated learning, but we also sweat the extra detail and attention to ensure that we are also delivering an experience that is unique and impactful rather than just a solution. And as we hit the maturity in our teams with putting design-oriented thinking and user research and care for the customers front and center, then we stop having these kind of conversations around what defines ready to be shipped. We all become committed to doing the best, delivering the best for our customers and strive to move from um, MVP to MLP. So how do we do that? What are the best practices to avoid rushing releases and balance speed with quality? So at, at Envision, this definition of done creates a common ground for us, a shared understanding for when to say yes or no to the gods of release dates. And design QA process similarly helps us ensure that the design work that is implemented matches with the actual designs. These are just a few examples, but these help us achieve three, three, um, three major things. Healthy discussion, right prioritization with intention and reaching a consensus as a team. Estimation, realistic and um, reasonable estimation that's not going to frustrate anybody at the end. And ultimately collaboration. And another best practice and methodology is building systems together where we speak the same language and drive consistent experiences while growing and scaling in all pil pillars. Yes, I'm talking about design systems. Through design systems, uh, we recognize the value of collaboration, thinking collectively, and most importantly, bridging the gap between design and development. And it also accelerates our design and implementation process drastically. So here, as Doug Powell from um, IBM states, we are constantly delivering to our customers, right? We just cannot wait for months to release an update and deliver, continue delivering value. We have to be building an operation here, right? That can meet that need. Because if we don't, we become irrelevant. But unfortunately, we overuse and misuse this practice in so many different ways. We forget that building a system, not just a design system, but an experience design system is equal parts art and science at the intersection of analytical thinking, emotional design, and human psychology. And to be honest, actually, I don't even enjoy the name design systems because it, it, makes, it, it makes it sound like it's a designer's job. But in reality, it's a multidisciplinary approach and behavior to how you think about holistic solutions as an organization. And what do I mean by that? Not the whole story of designers designing a button as a component and developers coming in and building those components, but it's more like design and development working in parallel. Developers being a core part of the systems thinking, systems team, and contributing to the problem solving rather than just implementing design systems. And going just beyond buttons, right? Crafting guidelines for how to tell better stories or build intuitive and consistent keyboard shortcuts so that, for our, um, so that our customers can be efficient and fast. Or content and copy, copy guidelines for how designers and developers, product managers, we can all understand the brand's voice and tone. Or even when we are building a set of uh, a portfolio of products and services, how to name our products in a consistent way so that it aligns with our brand and marketing and design strategy. So for true collaboration, we need to stop scratching the surface um, of the design systems and science the shit out of them for understanding the experiences that we want to deliver all together in a multidisciplinary way. And again, bonus points, this way, it encourages more collective and diverse thinking that genuinely bridge the gap across disciplines by empowering everybody around this much more extended shared vision. Uh, to sum up, teams that are purpose-driven communicate well, ideate and innovate creatively, collectively, and most importantly, champion one another and elevate the organization culture as a whole. All right, we are almost there. So final principle, how to get from good to great, is ultimately about how you're designing thoughtfully and intentionally for our users. So great design is also a product of 
thorough understanding of our users. We all want to build remarkable and memorable products that have a long-term connection with users. And this successful long-term relationship can only be achieved by understanding what makes our customers tick, how our brains work, and how we process data, emotions, how we make decisions, and react in complex situations. So let's dive into a few like practical reasons, um, practical guidelines for how we can design for our users. So from the moment we are born, we are emotional, period, right? Even as a baby, even when our vision might be blurry, we pay special attention to faces. We are quickly able to identify our mothers. We prefer the sound of voices to non-speech sounds, as in we prefer somebody's laugh um, over the dripping water in, in the sink. We are all emotional beings, like Steph was talking about. We all enjoy emotional stories, and we all want to be happy. And when it comes to productivity, it's the same. We want to achieve goals, we want to feel rewarded and be happy again. So in summary, as human beings, we are simple and we like things to be simple. So as designers, PMs, developers, maybe we should stop thinking about delight, magic, the wow effect, and instead try to understand the basics of how to human. And it all starts with how to speak human and be relatable, because we empower our users through the power of words and language in all the experiences that we deliver, whether we realize it or not. So an example at Microsoft, when we were designing a productivity app called To Do, maybe it's a cheesy way to say, but our mission was to help people um, become better versions of themselves. And this is such an intimate part of human life, like setting goals, feeling of achievement, and enjoying productivity. And interestingly, the team discovered the cognitive details around the naming conventions and how users uh, were relying on naming, the, naming the, their lists to regain the control over their productivity. And that's how the team landed on this concept called My Day, with each day starting with a clean slate and encouraging the brain to focus on one single day, which is today. And this way, we were able to trigger our, our user's brain to think in today's context and constraint and be realistic about their goals, because we don't want our users to actually create all that clutter, add all that tasks, dumping dozens of them in a day, and then finishing the day with only a few check marks and feeling like an unproductive crap. So, Let's continue, never under, underestimate the context. We really cannot emphasize this enough. Context is the key. We need to design and build experiences that are personalized, contextual to meet the user's unique needs based on their situation, surrounding, and context of use. So technology and design hand in hand need to adapt and learn how to enhance the user experience based on context. So a good example for this, at Microsoft, we tried to use Cortana to analyze semantic data in various parts of our user's life and provide additional experience, additional intelligence with relevant and critical information that the users might want or need to know, depending on our context. And in this example, for instance, for a flight and trip context, what can be identified as a benefit, advantage for the user, such as weather, traffic, or terminal, and gate info? Another practical tip and guideline, deliver meaningful value, deliver meaningful content. Always designing meaningful, meaningful content um, leads to great experiences, great conversations that our users would have with our content. We cannot just design the content and the means to navigate, browse through this content. We also need to build meaningful relationships to connect with our users. And let's be real, if it's not meaningful content and connection, our users will automatically filter them out because our brains are wired to do so as well. We have limited vision, memory, processing capabilities. These are our natural flows as humans. So when this is the harsh reality of our evolution, we need to be more mindful about what content we are putting in front of our users and how we connect the dots while triggering the right emotions and pushing the right cognitive buttons. And it's hard as hell to create this kind of meaningful content in digital era, right? Like any vinyl, vinyl record fans in the room? Like you might, you might remember, you, you might probably remember right now if I ask you um, how many records you have. 
or you might remember where you got those records, who were you with, which places, etc. And now think about your Spotify list. Think about how many albums you have there, whose albums you have saved. So it's really hard, right? Like as you as you transform from the analog world to the digital world, creating that meaningful connection with the content that we have. So on Swarm, the check-in was the primary content and currency for us, the location data. The check-ins followed by friends data, updates, photos, and more, other more content. So instead of listing all the check-in content in a flat list, we chose to group them systematically and emotionally based on where each person was and their neighborhoods, thinking that consuming content in this way would also create meaningful and exciting ways to connect people. Seeing that your friend is only five minutes away in your neighborhood, does that encourage you to keep up and meet up with them? All right, sweat the details. Like Charles Eames famously said, the details are not the details, the details are actually the design. So they are more than just a coat of paint, right? The, they help us build trust in our users and hence our experience and brand. So every interaction that our users has with our product elicits an emotional response and we should be crafting those emotional responses intentionally. So for example, Wunderlist plays this twinkling sound when you complete a task, you will be hearing soon, making the achievement feel special. It's based on C major, seven chord. Can we hear it? Hmm. All right. Yes, yes, all right, we've, we've finally heard it. So it's based on C major seven chord. The corresponding mode on that scale is relaxing yet cheerful. The underlying chord construction is also matched with the character of simplicity, happy, sounding similar to children's cheerful talk. And from a visual sensorial experience, it is triggering certain visual stimuli associated with nature, landscape, tranquility. So basically, this was the relaxation effect that we wanted to design for our, for our users when they complete a task. So paired with the emotional audio and the visual sensorial experience, we create the strong sense of positivity after you complete a task and hear this twinkling ding sound. So it's fascinating, right, to see the science and the art and the detail that goes behind, be, beyond really these like small details. And when you design those details, your users definitely recognize it and appreciate it. So like this guy, for example, he's just adding random things and completing them just to hear this check, just to hear this ding song at the end. All right, design for the flow and help your users get shit done. So what do I mean by that? So empowering our users to be productive, keeping them motivated, in their productive and creative flow, helping them boost the intrinsic motivation, right? And, and, and enhancing positive experience at the end. So basically the experience that we design should work as, 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 as expected with distraction-free interaction leading to motivation and productivity. So where does this flow come from? It originates from this concept of operational and highly focused mental state that Mihail Csikszentmihalyi, I'm probably butchering his last name, a Hungarian psychologist recognized and named as flow. He has a very powerful TED talk too, I highly recommend it. He describes this as the state of concentration and complete absorption with the activity and situation at hand and deep enjoyment, creativity and total involvement where we can call it also like in the zone or in the groove. So this was the model, this was the flow model that he developed. And I see it as, for us as designers, I see it as like the no bullshit model. So no bullshit model where we design experiences that minimize the apathy, worry, anxiety, and increase the relaxation by giving the full control to the users and help them get into the groove. So for Inspect, a tool that we designed at Envision, which is a tool for design and development collaboration where designers uh, share their designs with developers and inviting them to their uh, process and developers receiving everything they need to successfully implement a design. In the design of Inspect, uh, clear navigation and information hierarchy was leading us to minimize the pain of finding things that 
uh, developers need. And with the right references to the most updated, latest design, developers don't need to go back and recode it, leading to motivation and productivity. And it was also helping them get into the groove by integrating all of this into their daily tools, into their powerful uh, developer tools like Jira, Confluence, and Trello. So, design for trust. Trust can be a magical word, right? Like we feel it more in our guts rather than thinking rationally about it. Trying to discern if somebody can be trusted is fundamentally different than um, trying to assess somebody's, somebody, somebody's mathematical ability, right? So even the way the brain process trust is one of the complex activities in human body. So when we are weighing decisions and collecting cues to trust, to trust somebody, we are actually, like our brains are actually quite, uh, quite active. And um, they, we are also triggering a lot of parts of the brain from uh, judgment to surprisingly pleasure, pleasure center. So actually bonus points when you're designing a product that earns the customer's trust, you're also hitting the jackpot for pleasure for a happy user. And when it comes to designing experience, um, the bottom line for trust is users want to feel confident in their choices and they don't want to be let down by us. So for Foursquare, the trust was deeply rooted in the content. As we know, platforms with user-generated content can always be a bit tricky, always struggle with trust. In Foursquare's case, the, we had tips that were public notes that anybody can leave about a place, talking about their experience that they like or dislike. Since anybody could leave a tip, some of the users were quite skeptical about how genuine these tips were. Are they written by somebody in Bangladesh for five cents a piece? Or the restaurant owner opening up fake accounts and praising, praising um, their, their own place, so on and so forth. So we first tried to design certain signals um, of engagement and trust, like save and liking a tip, but it was a, a bit ambiguous. Then we introduce rating, like liking, disliking, or meh. Then we start to see that we needed more lightweight signals um, so that people can easily engage and understand. So then we realized that people were actually very familiar with the notion of uh, voting, a better evaluation technique that was very successful in a lot of community-driven platforms like ours where people express their positive and negative emotions by simply voting. So upvoting a tip if you agree, downvoting a tip if you disagree. So we aim to, dis we aim to gain this trust in our user-generated content by understanding what makes them tick, what leads to authentic content, and then creating the right inputs and outputs for more personable and trustworthy relationships. So that's all I have for today. Hope we all uh, achieve delivering not just good, but great, remarkable experiences that our users love. And whether whatever we are building, wherever we are building, I hope that we do what we do with professionalism, integrity, and people in mind, and both the people that we work with and the people that we design for. Thank you. So I just have one quick question. All right. Um, there was a lot of uh, responses to the um, culture ad first instead of culture fit. Yes. Um, I love that. So hiring is often still being approached as a position that exists in isolation. Do you have any tips or experiences for improving, uh, improving uh, inclusivity in teams? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, I think every company, uh, regardless of the size, scale, uh, where they are in their like growth phase, um, every company needs a diversity working group, a group that is really passionate about the subject matter, that's looking into like the best practices, methodologies to increase the diversity in teams. So starting with this group, I think looking at certain like uh, really basic practices, like how you create a job description to how you're really creating this welcoming culture for your company, how you're representing your company in certain community networking events at meetups, etc. So I think like really starting from uh, looking at the basics of um, how we represent ourselves, how we really become like the advocates of um, diversity, going to like events, reaching out to people proactively. Because I think, you know, when it comes to hiring for diversity, it's a very limited way of thinking about like just the pipeline. 
like saying that, oh, we just don't have enough applicants. Oh, like we are just, you know, this is the pipeline that we're dealing with. But it's about being proactive. It's about going out there and doing more than just the average and um, going out there and really finding the right talent. Yeah, I love that. Thanks so much for advocating for that. Thank you. So um, are you going to be around during the breaks for any more questions? Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. All right. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.